President, no issue dominates our attention more these days than our growing rivalry with China, and, and rightly so. It's a historic challenge. Um, it's one that I think we waited way too long to recognize, and now we're scrambling to, to make up for that. But I think in that, all the attention that's being paid to this, I, th I think it's important that we remember, or at least recognize, that, that the core and central issue here is, is not China, per se, and by itself. The core issue here is a decades-old bipartisan consensus that's entrenched in our economic and, and in our economics and in our politics. A consensus that said that economic globalization would deliver wealth and freedom and peace. It was almost a, a religious faith in the power of the free flow of people and money and goods across borders as the answer to virtually every problem that faced the world. And, and that's how we built our politics. That's how we built our foreign policy. And, and you know what? For about 50 years after World War II, it generally worked. And the reason why it generally worked is because we didn't actually have a global market. If you looked at the economy that we were engaged in, even through free trade and the like during that period of time, it was primarily a market made up of democratic allies, of countries that shared common values and common priorities for the future. And even when the outcomes during that time were not always in our benefit, even when maybe some industry left to a country in Europe, or maybe uh, during the time that Japan challenged us in some sectors from Asia, at least the beneficiary even though it may have harmed us in the short term, the beneficiary of that outcome was not the Soviet bloc, the Soviet Union, or some geopolitical competitor. The, the beneficiary was another democ democracy and an ally in, in, in our confrontation with communism during that period of time. The point is, it generally worked during that time because by and large, the interest of the global market and the interest of our country never got out of balance too far. And then the Cold War ended. And our leaders, and I say our leaders because this was really a bipartisan thing, our leaders b became intoxicated with hubris. I remember, you know, the lexicon was, it's the end of history, and the world will now be flat, and every country is now going to naturally become a free enterprise democracy, and economic liberalization would always result in political freedom. Right? You flood a country with capitalism, and that camp country will not just get rich, but they're going to turn into us, or some version of one of our democratic allies. And so in pursuit of, of that historic gamble, which had no historic precedent, we entered into all kinds of trade deals and treaties and rules and regulations on an international scale. And we invited into that all kinds of countries that, by the way, were not democracies, did not share our values, and did not have the same long-term goals for the world as we did. Their long-term goals, in fact, were incompatible. And of all the deals that were made, none has had a greater impact than the decision that was made in the first year of this century to admit China into the World Trade Organization. They opened up our economy to the most populous nation on earth, controlled by a communist regime, and they did it not because anybody argued that would be good for American workers or America. I mean, they made the arguments that eventually it would be, but they weren't arguing this is going to help us in the short term, this is good for our industries. They did it, the, one of the arguments, the central arguments behind doing this with China was, we think capitalism will change them, okay? They're going to eat Big Macs and drink Coca-Cola and they're going to literally ingest democracy and it will transform them, okay? They argued that capitalism was going to change China. Now we stand here 23 years later and realize capitalism didn't change China. China changed capitalism. They're, they, they opened up their doors and said, come on in. And, and they attracted with cheap labor. They said, we have cheap labor, cheap workers, and it flooded. Millions of American jobs, important industries, factories flooded into China, and they did it with the promise of you know, lure and American investors, American money poured into China. All of it with the promise that you can make a lot of money in this huge market very quickly, huge rates of return, and obviously for the countries, for the companies, lower labor costs, and therefore more profits for them. And we lost jobs, and factories closed, and towns were gutted. But the leaders at that time said, "Don't worry, they're only taking the bad jobs. The jobs that have left these are not the good jobs." These bad jobs are going to be replaced by good jobs, better jobs. Americans are going to be able to have those jobs. And, and those Chinese workers that took your jobs, they're going to get richer now. And with that money they've started to make, they're going to do two things. They're going to start buying American products, and they are going to turn, they're going to demand for democracy and freedom, and they're going to change China. Well, I don't think I'm going to spend a lot of time today explaining that that did not work out. That is not how it played out. China allowed our companies in. But you know what they did? They forced every one of these companies to partner with a Chinese company, a small one at the time. They forced you to partner with them, and they stole your trade secrets. So they invited them in, they learned how to do whatever it is you did, and when they no longer needed you, they kicked you out, their company took over, and in many cases, they put the company that taught them how to do it, 
or that they stole the secrets from, they put them out of business. That's what they did. They used it to build up their own economy, their own companies. The Chinese middle class also grew at a historic rate, but ours collapsed. An almost inverse effect. It, it, the, the numbers are stunning. If you look at the, the destruction of these American working class jobs and the rise of the middle class in China, they happen at the same time and at almost at the same scale. China did get rich. They most certainly got rich, but they didn't use that money to buy our products. They used that money to buy the products that are made in China. And they didn't become a democracy either. Now what you have is what was once a poor Chinese Communist Party. Now you have a rich Chinese Communist Party that has tightened its grip on the country and that's actually started going around the world trying to export their authoritarian model. They literally go around telling countries democracy cannot solve problems. Our system is so much better at solving problems. We can move quicker. We don't have to have a town hall meeting before we do everything. We can have strategic 20-year plans and we can solve your problems. And for developing countries around the world, it potentially has some appeal. The fact is that we're now confronted with the consequences of this historic and catastrophic mistake. And it's important to understand what some of these are, and they'll be familiar to you because we see them every day. They play out not just on the floor of the Senate, they play out in our society and our politics on television. First, we're a nation that's bitterly divided. And it's easy and lazy to say, well, we're divided, Republicans, Democrats, liberals, conservatives. This division is, frankly, the biggest division Americans are not even ideological, per se. They seem to be attitudinal. And largely, they seem to be along the lines of affluent class of people that work in jobs and careers and in industries and live in places that have benefited from this rearrangement of the global economy. They do jobs that pay well and that work in a system like this, divided against the millions of working people who are left behind by all these changes and live in places that are literally hollowed out, once vibrant communities that have been gutted. By the way, remember when they would say, don't worry, those people will move to somewhere else in the country for those new jobs. They didn't move because people don't like to leave their community. They don't like to leave their extended family. They don't like to leave all the things they've ever known and supported them. That didn't work that way. It's left us a country that's addicted. We are addicted to cheap exports from China. And we are dependent on Chinese supply chains, on everything from food to medicine to advanced technology. We just had a pandemic that reminded us of this. And what does that mean, these long supply chains dependent on a geopolitical competitor, it, it means we're vulnerable. Vulnerable to blackmail, vulnerable to coercion. You know what else it left us with? An economy that is highly concentrated and fragile. Our economy is primarily based today on two sectors. What's all the news about? Turn on the financial networks. You'll see what the, all the discussion is about. Primarily two sectors. Finance, meaning people that take your money and invest it somewhere else. They don't make anything. They invest your money. It's fine. That's a legitimate business. But finance and big tech. And those two industries that are now the pillar of our economy are controlled by just a small number of giant multinational corporations. The same ones that, by the way, outsourced our jobs. And these multinational corporations, they have more power than the government. In many cases, they have more power than the government. And they have no loyalty to our people or to our country. Their interest is not the national interest. They're multinationals. In fact, they're owned by shareholders and investment funds from all over the world. This idea that globalizing our economy would prevent great power competition between nations was always a delusion. And I think the people of Hong Kong and Taiwan and Ukraine can tell you that this idea that free trade always and automatically leads to peace, it isn't true either. None of us have ever lived in a world where America was not the most powerful nation on earth. I, um, I grew up, I was born into and grew up in a world where you know, two superpowers were faced off in this long, cold, and dangerous Cold War between communism and freedom, between the free world and people who lived enslaved behind an iron curtain. And then I came of age, literally came of age, 89, 91, 18 to 20 years of age, first years in college. I came of age, and suddenly I watched the Berlin Wall fall, and I saw the Soviet Union collapse. And let me tell you, if you had told me 10 years earlier, you told anybody, the Soviet Union is going to vanish off the face of the earth, there will be no more, wouldn't have believed it. It was a time when every, you know, truly historic and unprecedented. But now, three decades later, we find ourselves once again in a rivalry with another great power. And this rivalry is far more dangerous, and our rival is far more sophisticated than the Soviet Union ever was. The Soviet Union was never an industrial competitor. The Soviet Union was never a technological competitor. The Soviet Union was a geopolitical and a military competitor. But the near-peer rival in China that we have now, they have leverage over our economy. They have influence over our society. They have an army of unpaid lobbyists here in Washington. Unpaid lobbyists because these are the companies and the individuals that are benefiting from doing business in China. And they don't care if five years from now they won't even be able to work there anymore. They're making so much money off their investments, their factories, and their engagement there now that they lobby here for free. 
on their behalf. And by the way, this is a rival that has perfected, they have perfected the tactic of using our own media, our own universities, our own investment funds, our own corporations against us. They've used it against us every day. But in all this focus on China, and look, I've talked about, as much about China as anybody here, going back five, six years now. But this is not the story of what China has done to us. What China has done is they saw a system that we created. They took advantage of its benefits. They didn't live up to its obligations. You know why? Because China was trying to build their country. They were making decisions that was in China's national interest, not in the interest of the global economy or some fantasy about how if two nations are in business and there's a McDonald's in both countries, they'll never go to war. This is not the story of what China's done to us. This is the story of what we've done to ourselves because we've allowed this system of globalization to drive our economic policies and our politics, and it remains entrenched. Even now, people who agree that we have to do something about this will tell you, but we can't do that. We can't do that because it will hurt exports. They'll put a tariff on some industry. China will kick us off. None of this is going to matter in five, six years. They won't, they won't need the tariff farm goods from the United States. They'll own the farm. They're already buying up farmland. You don't have to worry about the investment funds won't be able to make a return on their investment in five years. They won't need their money anymore. So this system was a disaster. And the result of the system was not global peace and global prosperity. The result was not the world without walls in which we were all part of one big happy human family. The reality was people live in nations and nations have interests. And by and large, for almost all of human history, nations have acted in the interest of their nations. And now we see what happens when one side does that and the other does not. The result has been the rise of China and big business. The two big winners in all of this is the consolidation of corporate power in the hands of a handful of companies in key industries and the rise, the rapid and historic rise of China at our expense. China is a populist country. They're always going to be a superpower. They were always going to be one. But they did it faster because they did it at our expense. They didn't create these jobs. They moved them. They didn't create these industries. They took them. We buy solar panels from China. Who invented solar panels? We did. They lead the world now in battery productions for these electric vehicles. We invented it. They make them, they perfect it, they now lead the technology. I can go on and on. They're building more coal-fired plants than any country on earth. Today, China has more surplus refining capacity for oil than any nation on the planet. This era has to end now. It's not about just taking on China, it is about changing the way we think. It's not 2000 anymore. It's not 1999 anymore. This is a different world. And in a series of speeches over the next few weeks, I'm, I'm gonna attempt to outline a coherent alternative moving forward in the hopes that we don't just sit around here all day trying to outdo each other about who's going to ban this and who's going to block that going to China. This is about a lot more than just banning this and stopping that. It's about a coherent approach to a difficult and historic challenge. And look, it's a complicated one. And complicated problems rarely if ever have simple solutions. But the simplest way I can describe how I think we should move forward, and I'll have to describe it obviously in more detail, is we need to fundamentally realign the assumptions and the ideas behind our economic and foreign policies. We need a new system of global economics where we enter into global trade agreements, not with the goal of doing what's good for the global economy, but what's good for us. If a trade deal creates American jobs or strengthens an Ameri a key American industry, we do that deal. If it undermines us, we don't do the deal just because it would be good for the global economy or because in the market, free market lab experiment, it's the right thing to do. We don't live in a lab. We're human beings of flesh and blood who live in the real world. In a lab, when a factory leaves, and an economic theory, when a factory leaves and a job is lost, it's just a number on a spreadsheet. In real life, when a factory leaves and a job is lost, a dad loses his job, a mom loses, a single mom, for example, loses the ability to support her family, and a community is gutted. So we'll need to enter into global trade agreements. We're not talking about isolationism here, but the, great tri the criteria for every agreement needs to be, is it good for our industries and workers, or is it bad? It sounds pretty simplistic. I don't know how, who anyone could disagree that we should not enter into trade agreements that are bad for American workers and bad for key industries. We also, by the way, need to enter in, into uh, foreign policy alliances that reward our allies and strengthen those who share our values and our principles. And that also, by the way, help create American jobs and strengthen American industry. And if it can't be here, then strengthen the ability of an ally to be the source of our supplies. But I will tell you this at the outset, it will not be easy because those who have prospered and flourished under the status quo, they still have a lot of power, and they will use it to protect that status quo. But we have no choice but to change direction because our success or our failure is going to define the 21st century.